Wildlife Service biologist. And Harold, we're here on behalf of the Wildlife Society to do an interview with you. Um, and the whole purpose of it is for a project that the Wildlife Society is working on called Celebrating Our Wildlife Conservation Heritage. And you've been selected because your distinguished career and your dedication to the wildlife resource, especially in the Prairie Pothole region. Um, and you were selected to hopefully through this program, continue your legacy for future generations as to what your accomplishments have been, what the resource was like when you started, uh, the profession was like when you started, and uh, perhaps how things have changed over the, the years that uh, you were involved in, in uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service and your other endeavors. Just cover a lot of ground there, Tony. <laughs> well, that's a good place to start. Uh... Earlier we discussed a map I have over here on the wall. If you want to get the light sure. pan over there, and I can tell you where I got my start. My birthplace and boyhood home was a little town called Wellington, Missouri, east of Kansas City, on the Missouri River. I was born down there June 30th, 1929. And uh, Missouri River was a major migration corridor for waterfowl. So from my earliest recollection, I can remember the spring and fall migration of waterfowl going over. And uh, there were quite a few waterfowl hunters in the little town, including some of my relatives. So as a little kid crawling around, I'd see them come home with their ducks, and uh, that's basically where I became enamored with waterfowl. And uh, I went to high school there in Wellington. I graduated in 1947, uh, 1947, I went to a little college, Central Missouri State College here at Warrensburg, Missouri. In 1951, I was drafted in the U.S. Army, and I spent uh, 18 months with infantry in Korea. And uh, after I returned from the Korean War, I entered the University of Missouri down here at Columbia and I uh, obtained my master's degree in wildlife management in 1958. And that's what leads me into the, my career. I was a 26-year-old bachelor. I had a 53 Chevy, and I learned about a, a summer assistant job, we call them under the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, at a refuge in North Dakota. It was called Lower Suris National Wildlife Refuge at that time. It's been later renamed J. Clark Sire. So in 1955, I come driving up here in my 53 Chevy, got to Grand Forks, cut west over here, past Devil's Lake, over here to the Lower Source Refuge. And uh, I actually conducted the research for my master's degree over at Lower Source, it's entitled Island Nesting of the Gadwall in North Dakota. After I got my degree in 1958, I worked for the North Dakota Game and Fish Department for a few years down here at uh, Oaks, North Dakota. And after two years, I joined the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in 1960. And my first job was a, uh, with the Small Wetland Acquisition Program at Devil's Lake, North Dakota. Uh, my first role there was as a delineation biologist. Went around and selected areas for uh, key areas and easement. After being in that role, I was a wetland manager, the first one at Devil's Lake. And uh, we're covering a lot of ground here pretty fast, but 
I don't know how long you want me to be on. Anyway, after Devil's Lake, I had an opportunity to move out to uh, Malheur National Wildlife Refuge in Oregon as a wildlife management biologist. I was out there for about three years. And in 1966, I moved back to the newly established Northern Prairie Wildlife Research Center at uh, Jamestown, North Dakota. And I remained there 21 years. Conducted a lot of research on prairie nesting ducks. And as far as the Wildlife Society, I've been a member of the Wildlife Society ever since 1955. Uh, one more year will be 50 years. I served as the president of the North Dakota chapter. I think it was in 1970. 1978, I was awarded the professional award from the North Dakota chapter. That's a pretty quick rundown. Grad school in 1958. 1958. Yep. And then you moved back. You moved to North Dakota. Yeah. That I'm same year. 1958. I, I had my first job with the North Dakota Game and Fish Department at the okay. Oaks. And I was an upland game biologist. Okay. Are you running? Okay. Well, all right. So, 1958, you moved to North Dakota Game and Fish. Yep. And at Oaks, you were a game and fish biologist. Upland game biologist. Upland game biologist. I mostly work with waterfowl. I mean, with the pheasant. Okay. So, you were working on habitat development or mostly, management practices? Mostly, mostly, I did a research project uh, trying to relate why pheasant populations are thriving in certain areas, not in other areas. So, I looked at the uh, land use, soils, and weather differences. But my whole motivation was being waterfowl work, see. I wanted to be in North Dakota, but I couldn't get an opening with the service right then, so I, I went to work for North Dakota Game and Fish. But after a couple of years, I could see, I didn't see any waterfowl work opening up. So that's why I, I applied for the Fish and Wildlife Service, and I began my career with them in 1960. Okay. Now, North Dakota, North Dakota, you were at Oaks. Yep. What, what was the, if you could make a comparison between what the habitat base was then as to what it is now, 1958 to 19 or 2004. Well, of course, it's been thousands of small wetland drain, thousands of acres of native prairie plowed up. The, uh, both the wetland base and the upland habitat base is greatly diminished. On the plus side, of course, uh, this major land acquisition program, the crop, uh, crop land, <laughs> that's the main Conservation thing. Reserve. Conservation Reserve program, put millions of acres of good nesting habitat back on the land, been a tremendous boon for nesting ducks and uh, upland game and deer as well as a whole host of non-game species. So, I look at the Conservation Reserve Program as kind of a short-term blip on the landscape. It may or may not last forever, so I'm concerned that the overall habitat base has been slipping on the plus side, especially here in Minnesota. been some very aggressive programs by Ducks Unlimited, the Minnesota Waterfowl Association, which you affiliated with, and they acquired thousands of acres of land. Of course, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Program, uh, managed by Jim Peel here at the local office, restored thousands of small wetlands. I'm enthused about, I think it's a bright, I think a, we've been to the low point about environmental awareness. I see it, uh, a lot of American citizens being more and more aware of the need for having a decent environment. So I'm looking, I, I put it this way, I've said many times, for about the last 150 years, uh, the human race seemed hell bent on uh, destroying habitat. I say in the next 50, 150 years, we're going to be putting it back. And we're seeing it right now, restoring green wetland, putting habitat back on the upland. We even hear such radical things as removing dams to put in in the drought years. And like I say, I'm, in, I'm encouraged about 
the prospect for the future. Okay. I want to say one thing about, uh, I feel privileged to have known some of the, the really great men in waterfowl. I think of people like Jerry Stout, Al Smith, who were biologists. When I was a youngster, they were mature and doing a lot of wonderful work in the Canadian prairies. It's impressed me now that I'm retired. I've been retired since 1987. But I look at uh, the whole man, the game management profession. Each generation comes along and performs beautiful services. And now I'm retired, but I see younger people come along like yourself, Jim Peel, I can name many others, but much of we refer to the older generation, but each generation has a wonderful job to do. And I'm enthused about that. Good. Um, so you spent two years in North Dakota as their upland bird biologist. Yep. And then you moved to Malheur Refuge. No. No, from there you... From Oaks, I moved to, that's when I moved to Lower Source. Lower Source, that's right. That was in 1960. So two, you spent two years in, in North Dakota I was only in fish. I'm not quite through yet. I, I was only at Lower Service less than one year. And then I moved to uh, Devil's Lake. Uh, the Small Wetland Acquisition Program was only one year old in 1960, so I was, I was one of the pioneers in that program. Tell me what it was like at Devil's Lake during the 1960s to start a small wetland acquisition program. That must have been uh, challenging. Well, Drainage was uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture Soil Conservation Service. They were promoting wetland drainage back in those days. And so we were kind of a bad guy, you know, saying that's not a good thing to do, drain those wetlands. So there's a fair amount of antagonism, you know, between the different branches. But there's a, I look at the, I guess people in my generation were all passionate about what we were doing. <laughs> we saw the wetland being drained, the prairie being plowed up, and uh, I'd say we had a lot of passion for what we were doing. I don't know if that answered your question, but I was, we heard a lot about the flooding of Devil's Lake in recent years. And of course, I was, I was up there when I saw all the I call it the most rapacious land use I've seen anywhere occurred in the Devil's Lake Basin. Thousands of small wetlands are drained, and uh, of course all that water rushed into Devil's Lake is almost inevitable that you flood. I always point out that the drainage of wetlands didn't cause the flooding of the river valleys or the rise in the lake levels, but it added something to the crest where a lot of the damage took place. You keep me on track, Tony. I will. <laughs> I'm, I'm fascinated. You know, the, this, the, the controversy that's occurred in the Dakotas over wetland drainage and, and the um, canal systems, and this, even, even when we talk about the service, the Fish and Wildlife Service being in North Dakota and operating there, um, it, it just fascinates me that you were in the ground floor of that whole small wetland acquisition program and what it's accomplished since it started in 1960. That's true, 45 years ago. And it was people like you, you, who laid the groundwork for us. And my wife works for the service in the realty program in Minnesota doing wetland acquisition program today. Yeah. So it's a, it's a fascinating tie for me. I just would like to hear more about what what your job was like on a daily basis. Oh, okay, yeah, that's, that's all you gotta, you gotta work hard to keep me on track. Most, like I say, my first job, we were called delineation biologists. And, and here you had the whole landscape and we had to pick out areas for fee purchase and easement. So we worked from a four inch, four inch of the mile aerial, aerial photography. And we usually work by townships, and we have a, a aerial photographer in the one township. And we study those aerial photos, and 
pick out areas that look pretty good, then we go check them on the ground. And basically, uh, we draw a line around which we recommend for purchase. And it's been, you know, it's been a long time ago. So many details are a little fuzzy, but there were different, uh, we had different uh, priority ratings. We had an A area was very susceptible to drainage and high quality. And that's the one they try to preserve first. B area was kind of moderate. C area had a, a very low probability of draining. Another big change that took place, remember uh, early on, before you could take easements, you had to have a fee area, an area owned in fee acquisition. That pretty soon become apparent there were a lot of landscapes in the prairie pothole region, and the Devil's Lake Basin, one of them, there were thousands of small wetlands, seasonal wetlands. We recognized early on about the shallow wetlands being valuable. So pretty soon they dispensed with the idea of needing a fee area to take easements anywhere if they were good quality wetland. I think that's somewhat... Okay, yeah, about. absolutely. Now, I tell you, and of course there's a lot of pressure too to get the job done. I did a lot of my delineation in the winter time, you know, like right now, December and January. So you got your aerial photos and the wetland looked pretty good. You go look at it and there's snow was three or four feet deep. And uh, I can remember digging down to deep snow drifts looking for fragments of vegetation. You see bull rice down there, and while the wetland had been dry, I'd see a mats of sago pondweed, which I knew was a good food. And then I lived long enough to see water return to those areas, and the stuff I looked at through snow drifts when they got water was beautiful, high quality wetland. That's one memory I have. Sure. And uh, the heat was on, like the big boys came out from the regional office and said, you guys got to get this done. And I was just, I think I was 31, 32 years old, kind of grayish, you know what I mean? <laughs> so you felt a little pressure? Well, another thing I want to say, we had a, a great deal of camaraderie among our group. Like, we had the Devil's Lake and Grady Manor over here in Fergus. Uh, a fellow named Milt Reeves in Aberdeen, Clyde Oden was in Jamestown, and Bull Madden was at Devil's Lake, he was my boss here. And so we'd get together and we'd rally and all say, <laughs> we were full of fight, is the way I want to put it. <laughs> well, knowing some of those folks yeah. who, you, who you describe, they can understand that. Yeah. Now you, you were there and what was your grade level when you were doing this? It was uh, my interest. That was a GS-5. So you started doing this as a GS-5? GS-5, and I graduated up to 7. I think when I was in Devil's Lake, as a wetland manager, I was a GS-9. And I went to Malheur as a wildlife management biologist for more than 11. And that was, a, that was a beautiful part of my career. I loved being out there. Because in the Malheur Lake was a huge shallow marsh out in the desert. And, uh, I love the prairie, but there's something about that high desert that grows on you too. My children are in grade school and it was such an isolated place and the school system weren't very good after about the third grade. The kids had to go to boarding school, it's like going away to college. And I didn't want to subject my children to that, so that's when I moved back to Northern Prairie Wildlife Research Center, which was in 1966. Okay. And, and how many kids do you have? Two. I have two daughters. Okay, and they they were born? One, in one North daughter was born in Oaks, North Dakota. The other daughter, Karen, was born in uh, Devil's Lake. Devil's Lake. Yeah. Okay. So they were they were infants or very small before. When yeah, you moved to Mallee here, they were young Julie, youngsters. Julie, my older daughter, Julie, started first grade up there. Okay. So first grade, she would have been about six years old. Place somewhere. called the Sod House School. Well, Sod House. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't actually a Sod House. It was. This was ranching country. It was an entire county for the refuge. It was, it was nine thousand square miles. I think it was six thousand people in the whole county. So a lot of wide open space. How far away was the school? Well, it would have been like. 
60, 70 miles. Oh, you mean the first squad? Well, it was only a couple miles. A couple away. miles, and then as they go. Well, it was then like 60 miles. You know? okay. So when did they go to boarding school? At what age? They never did. That's when we okay. moved back to Jamestown. So you moved back to Jamestown in 1966. So. Yeah, and both girls went all through school in Jamestown, basically. Okay. So from your job as manager, you, you went from a delineation biologist to a manager at Devil's Lake. Yep. And how is that different? In your, if you looked at it as a job, uh, different from what you were doing before as a well, upland bird biologist and a delineation biologist? I've always been interested in uh, habitat management. That's why being you know, a wetland manager is very exciting to me. We've got all these new areas, and of course, had to be cropland had to be seeded at the back of grass. We developed different grazing systems and that type of thing. So. I enjoyed the management part of it. People management? Didn't do too much of that. Well, I had to meet with the farmers. A lot right. of the work was done by the landowners. I actually like working on the land, developing habitat. Okay. And then as you moved down as manager at Mallet here? Actually, wildlife management biology. Okay. There. And that was, I enjoyed that. I, I had my free reign. I did a lot of, uh, waterfowl studies out there and I probably would have stayed there longer except this opening came with Northern Prairie and I always wanted to be involved in waterfowl research. That's when I moved back there. I feel very fortunate I was able to spend 21 years with a great group of people out there. When you were at Mallet here what you and you did, were doing waterfowl research what were you working on? What was your keen interest? Well, of course, it's like any refuge, you had to conduct breeding pair counts, you had to develop an estimate of the breeding population, then we go uh, conduct brood counts. I did a, quite a bit of public relations work there. We had, it was a very popular birding area. We had a lot of uh, birding groups come in from Western Oregon, and quite often they'd have a chartered bus, you know, I'd be up front with the mic talking about birds. <laughs> one funny thing happened, we got to loosen up a little bit. <laughs> I drive along here on the bus one day in the spring, and the elderly woman in the back said, stop the bus, stop the bus. I see a flamingo. <laughs> of course, here in the Oregon desert, you know, a mile, a thousand miles, man, flamingo. We stopped the bus, everybody got the binoculars. What it was, it was a hot summer day, and this was a river where there were trout, and here was a guy with his no shirt on and his, his sunburned arm, and it looked like this. And it did look like a flamingo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the funny things. I, I enjoy that, you know, taking tours around. Okay, you spent how many years? At, I was there about three years. Three years in Mallet here. High Mountain Desert Refuge. I call it cold desert. Cold, cold desert. desert. Yeah. It's basically sagebrush. Just uh, the lake was a cold basin, and the, and the water supply came from two mountain ranges, north and south. It was just, you know, you know how I love marshes. It's just a fabulous. Cause it's time I was. It's like Devil's Lake. It had a history of being dry, and it could be very vast. When I was there, it was about sixty thousand acres in size. And extend 20 miles one way and 30 miles another way. Very pristine. You got out in the middle, it's just like that the Pleistocene 10,000 years ago. Of course, I'm a hunter also, and that was a fabulous hunting area. You could roll your boat out in there, and you see no other human beings or sights and sounds of man. It's just very primitive. <laughs> you had lots of free reign as to what you were doing out there. Pretty much. I was a refuge manager. I guess he had faith in me. He kind of let me do what I wanted. Who was the manager there at the time? His name was John Sharp. And he was, uh, he'd been there 30 years. He spent almost his entire career on one place. He had a saying, and uh, he was deeply in love with that country. He said, if you wear out one pair of boots in Harney County, Oregon, he said, you'll never leave. And I found that to be true. It's the kind of country that grows on you. Of course, uh, basically, I'm a prairie lover at heart, so 
the prairie had a strong pull. I mean, all, all while I was out there, I kept wanting to get back. That was your draw back to North Dakota. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and like I say, I feel very fortunate I was able to spend the 21 years on the staff in Northern Prairie with some of the finest of biologists, I think, in the world. So you moved back there in 1866. I, I came in 66 and retired in 87. 87. And when you started, the director was? The director was Harvey Nelson. The center was established in 1965, so it was only one year old when I got there. Harvey Nelson was the one that had the, he had the concept of a team. Like before then, research in the Fish and Wildlife Service, as I call it, fragmented. Each, each biologist did his own thing. He really didn't have a lot of practical application of management in some cases. Harvey Nelson, basically what he called a team approach. He hired, I think there were about 20 or 22 biologists on the staff. Each of us were specialists in a certain way. My specialty happened to be up in nesting waterfowl. Uh, others, George Swanson was a limnologist, did pioneering work on the feeding habits of ducks. Al Sardin was a predator specialist. That's just a couple of examples. And by the time all of our research we matured after we'd been there 20 years, we were able to integrate a lot of this. And uh, another good friend of mine, Luke Gordon, is the one that developed a Mahler model, which has a lot of use all over the country now. And you're using it right here in Minnesota. So I feel good about that. that my work had, I call it practical application. A lot of my Research results were used by managers. I think more importantly, we're able to tie it all together. Get you know, a much better understanding of breeding waterfowl. Do you do you think that because you came from a management background up to that point, that it had an influence on oh, your thought very, process? Oh, very strong. In fact, I, I work among people where uh, they kind of. I don't know how to put it. I always said I had one foot in the management camp, I had one foot in the research camp, but I was always thinking about what I'm doing, is it going to have application, is it going to help a manager? And you're, you're right on there because I've been a manager, I knew some of the problems that you faced. I always said that in the back of my mind. So what were some of your key research projects? I know you worked at Hosmer very in South Dakota, no. doing lots of work. What were your, what do you think were your key research uh, projects that you were working on? Well, Northern you? Prairie, we were divided up into sections. I should talk about that. And I was, in, I was assigned to the section of wildlife land use relationship. And the section chief was Harvey Miller. And our job was to uh, look at upland nesting ducks and we were trying to find out our, our target out in here. We're trying to find a nesting habitat that was attractive to nesting ducks, and also had a we call it a high security value. We knew that predation was a decimating influence way back in the '60s. So we're looking at some type of habitat that would draw ducks from other unsafe areas like on your WPAs, and uh, once they were there, we wanted a habitat that was somewhat secure from predation. And back then, the land retirement program under the Department of Agriculture is called the Cropland Adjustment Program, almost identical to the CRP today. That program, the farmers were paid to plant a grass legume cover on their cropland and leave it idle three or five or ten years. So I was doing some work in South Dakota. There's a big predator control project down there conducted by the South Dakota Department of Game Fish and Parks. And Harvey Nelson knew that within that area they're doing predator control for pheasants. It was also a good duck nesting area. So Harvey called me in the office and said, Harold, I want you to go down there and see what's happened to the ducks. <laughs> That's a simplified way of putting it. 
So I went down there and established some study areas. One study area was in the zone where predators were controlled. Another study area was outside where there was no predator control. Well, I looked at, back then, we did all of our net searching with a rope with tin can pulled by us, human beings. <laughs> it was hard work. But we found samples of nests in all kinds of habitats. Pastures, hay fields, fence rows, stubble fields, roadside fences, etc. And we just turned the page. Well, within this predator control zone, there were some of these fields that have been idle under the cropland adjustment program. Very lush stands are covered, grass like goon cover up to your chest. And uh, I had a black lab at that time. And I took it with me in my field work. One night, we'd been dragging these ropes all day looking for duck nests. I wanted to get out and stretch my legs and give the dog a break, but I turned her loose in one of these uh, cropland adjustment program fields, and the hens started popping up all over the place. I think in <laughs> five minutes I found 10 or 12 nests. Well, that, that signaled something special going on here. <laughs> so, uh, at that time, the cable chain drag had been developed uh, to the total between two military jeeps, a, a five inch inch cable with uh, loops of log chain behind. We were able to, to search cover a lot more efficiently. So we, we went down, we searched this field with 125 acres of cover. And, uh, I forgot the exact number, we found like 60 or 70 nests. And following the fate, they had very good success. And if we found the one field, then we went and searched some other fields. And, and the pattern seemed to develop. There was a high density of nests in those fields, and they seemed to hatch at a pretty good rate. So, the term dense nesting cover came into being. I, di I didn't really care for that phrase myself. The managers kind of picked up it. It was a, it was a cover composed of introduced cool season grasses, intermediate wheat grass, tall wheat grass, smooth grown alfalfa. Of course, there's a pretty good component of weeds in there too. But the ducks seem to be pulled into it like metal to a magnet. And it was there's some that uh, appeal to them there. Of course, the, probably the greatest discovery I made down there, one of the fields, the same one where we made the initial discovery was in the predator control zone. And the predators were almost reduced to nil. There were hardly any predators in 100 square miles. And so, we studied this one field for five years and had incredibly high density of duck nests. I don't have all my papers with me, but in five years, we found over 2,000 duck nests in this one little field. It's the highest density of duck nests known anywhere in the world. So when, when I go back and I look at background information, research information, Harold, Duber's name pops up frequently in, yeah. in my literature research. Yeah, so. my papers are readily accepted, I guess. I tried to write in such a way that uh, the work was easy to understand. And uh, you know, I, I take a little pride in it. I pick up books and that type of thing. A lot of my, uh, you know, I produced over 60 some technical articles, either when I was a sole author or co author. To get reprint requests. That was part of our job. We got mail from all over the world for these papers. It's, it's satisfying. It's one thing you made your success by. And it's not just my work. You pick up a book, you see a lot of papers came out of Northern Prairie. And they're still doing good work out there. And, and that 20 some year service time at Northern Prairie, what would you what would you uh, key in on as your most success, your biggest success, your most satisfying well, I think part of the job? I think the discovery of this uh, cover type, which is a 
it had what we wanted. It, it lured ducks in, and they were more successful in that cover than they were any place else. I remember sitting out there, and you could sit there in the morning, and there's pretty flat landscape. You could sit, you could see ducks for two or three miles, and here they come flying from wetlands two miles away over pastures, hay fields, all kinds of stuff. Drop into that cover. It tells you there's something there that they like. <laughs> Where I'm sitting. Get this one. Well, back up when I was at. Uh, Wildlife management biologist out of now your National Wildlife Festival. Uh, part of my job was uh, we did aerial surveys of the ducks once a week. And the pilot biologist's name was Ray Glahn, who came out from Portland. And uh, he'd done a lot of that too, Tony, you know, it's like you're in that in a small plane and, and the pilot counts out one side and the biologist counts out the other side. So we we're he was intent looking out here and I was looking out here. Well, it so happened that uh, the B-52 bomber, that was their training area, they had come sneaking low, trying to sneak up on somebody over here, some enemy. And some reason or another, uh, he and I both looked out the front, and that thing, it may have been probably, I would say it was 100 yards in front of us, that big thing. And I always said, that could have been the end of Harold Duber's career right there, wiped out by a B-52. That was, yeah, that was a harrowing experience. Well, Ray Guam, you know, it's hard to find good duck hunting places out there because you're in the desert. But I've always been one, I study my map and I study my forward and I found this spring-fed marsh way back in the boondocks. And one day I was on annual leave and Ray Glahn had been flying. And he, he saw me back there I, I trying to hide. The, <laughs> and he dubbed that, the, he called that the High Desert Duck Club. <laughs> Funny thing. He found you. He found me. So. He was quite a guy, Ray Glahn. He, he wanted to go duck hunting with me one time. I said, yeah, that's fine, we'll go out. And he, I, he's staying in a motel in, in town. So I picked him up. He comes out of the motel room with a leather jacket on and a shotgun in the case. And uh, I said, where's your shell? He said, what's the limit here? I said, limit six ducks. He reached in his pocket and had seven shells. He said, well, I might have a cripple. Well, when I took him hunting, here come a duck. It's like he flew into a brick wall. I said, how'd you learn to shoot like that? He said, well, I, I was in the Air Force, and I took training as an aerial gunner. And, and, and back then, they had to shoot a case of shells every day. Well, human beings, what they are, some guy didn't want to shoot, and they had a coupon, he had to check it in, okay? So he'd gather up everybody's coupon and shoot their shells for him. And that's how he learned to shoot. He was a, I never will forget that. You know how hunters are, most people pick them up, and, Told your pickup for a year. He comes walking out with a leather jacket on, no hat, and he's gone. I said, Where's your shell? He said, Well, I got seven there. I might have a cripple. That's kind of a funny thing. So, did he use seven shells? I don't think he did. <laughs> We're bouncing around quite a bit. That's okay. You can chop out what you don't want. Go ahead. Another time we had a group of Japanese ornithologists out there. Of course, there's a white pelican doesn't occur in Japan. And, and Japanese are talking on their native tongue back there anyway and pretty soon. Ah! Pelican! Pelican! <laughs> of course, everybody else has seen pelicans all their life. I don't know why those things keep coming back. Funny, I guess. Yeah? Yeah? <laughs> And, and, uh, no, I, I kid around, Tony. People say, they want to know. I meet people here in town say, what'd you do? I said, I was a waterfowl biologist. I said, I got paid for having a good time. <laughs> I do. I feel I feel really fortunate being able to have a career like I had. And, uh, and my hobby's been waterfowl. I say, I live around waterfowl daily. Even right now, 
I'm back in the shop making decoy and I stood and read about it. But I guess I just got waterfowl deep in my blood somehow. So from that map, you're showing us yeah. Nicolay's map of of the the upper Midwest from Missouri to the Canadian border. I sit there and my mind just rolled and rolled. And that's a story in itself. It's a Frenchman, Joseph M. Nicolay, was an astronomer. And he came over here in 1859, mapped the entire upper Mississippi basin with pretty friendly instruments, I suppose. I read his books. You can imagine what an astronomer must have thought when he got out in these beautiful prairies of, and the bright stars and everything at night. But I do, I sit there and I look at that map. I've done a lot of living in that map, <laughs> on that map. Well, I just find it interesting that you have Nicolay's map there, and I know that you weren't around when he, he uh, sketched that out. <laughs> But you start at the south end of that map and you work your way all the way to the north. That's right. You were off the map when you were at Malahir. Yeah, well, for a little while. For a little while, for three years. It drew me back. It drew you back. It's, it, it, it's pole was there. Well, you can see Lake Superior up there and boundary waters. It's all on there. Yeah, I could almost write my life story on one map. And of course, I've always been enamored with Lewis and Clark, too, I think, but this is their either centennial, bicentennial year. They came right up past my hometown, and that's the thing that I think about. I stood down by the fire. So where does this deep sense of, of wanting to know about history and wanting to be tied to waterfall, where did, where did that come, where was that instilled in you? Well. Who can explain it? I don't know. Well, I had this old uh, great uncle back in Missouri, and he was a book lover, and he's a bachelor. And a lot of the time he'd move from one apartment to another, he couldn't move his bookcase, but he'd sit in, my, in our house, he'd have his bookcase, and I'd prowl around in there and read those books. And I can't explain All I know, I've had a passion for history all my life. One of my retirement jobs was just, here, just sitting right here. I decided to put together this book, uh, Wildfowling of Dakota, 1873-1903. What it is, it's a collection of duck and goose hunting stories from that era, which I collected uh, down in Minneapolis Public Library. And uh, I made photocopies of them, and I sold them to Tony and Jim and different people, and seemed to enjoy them. I think if somebody, I mean you told me, I said, I want to put those together in a book. So that's what I did. This came out uh, last September 2003. I've been selling a pretty good number of them. That's a good retirement job. It's been your lifeblood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I might say that. Waterfowling. And as a career, as a, as a vocation, and as an avocation. Yeah, no, that's really true. And it hasn't diminished in me yet. You hear a lot of people say, I used to hunt, but I don't hunt anymore. That hasn't hit me yet. I get just as excited each season as I did when I was just a youngster. Fortunately, I'm in good enough health. I can still move around pretty good. And we haven't even talked about your hobby. No. <laughs> which which, you know, that's that's just a part of what's going on here, but it ties to your career and, and your water following. You wanna talk about that? Well, we can have just a brief All right. little brief thing about I started when I was twelve years old making duck decoys. And uh, I still I work on them almost every day. This of course is my uh, vote for the king canvas back and uh, I make these out of white cedar logs with white pine heads. Almost all the work is done with hand tools. I use a bandsaw to saw out the main body outline, bandsaw, cut out the head, from then on all my work is done with hatchets and wood rat. I, I make gunning decoys that are made to be functional. I put a heavy oak keel on there and they're durable. I 
have a metal pin all the way up through the head. And so they're not going to break when you throw them in the sack. And I, I hunt over my decoy. I shot birds. Everything from uh, green winged teal to tundra swan over decoys I made with my own hands. Quite thrilling. And one of these guys floating around, here comes a big can, <laughs> land right next to it. It's been a very rewarding hobby for me. So you you were weaned on the Missouri River and cut your teeth on building decoys. Yeah, well... Twelve years old, you built your first decoy. Yeah, when I was just a kid, I started... I guess the older people could tell I had a passion. So I, I started hanging out with commercial fishermen. And, you know, we call them river rats down there. And uh, I don't know. I was lucky. They took a liking to me. I learned a lot from them. I built, I built a 16-foot rowboat when I was 15 years old, and learned how to navigate the Missouri River, which is known to be kind of a dangerous place to be. But those old, those guys taught me how to handle water. And uh, I built a, a duck boat in 1962, and I was up at Devil's Lake. That's over 30 years ago, and. Uh, I've hunted ducks out of that boat ever since. And I never tipped over with it. I'm proud of that. And I say it's because those old river guys taught me how to handle water. Just about any duck hunter you talk to, all my buddies back in Jamestown, all had outboard motors. Almost to a man, they all went down. <laughs> <laughs> they always been got after me to get a motor. I, I do all my rowing with oars. So if we, let's tie this back to your career as a waterfall yeah. biologist. From these beginnings on the Missouri River, yep. youngster carving decoys and hunting ducks and being with the river people, your career, your education, your career through the North Dakota Game and Fish, Fish and Wildlife Service. Don't forget the Wildlife Society, very important. Yeah, I still go, I go to the meetings every year. I like to keep up with what's going on. A recognized, honored individual from the Wildlife Society. Yeah. Very much so. That's a great outfit. Um, well, my wife, June, uh, my second wife, and, and she didn't grow up with a lot of the wildlife people. And more and more she got to meet them. She said, and all these guys in the wildlife profession are all good people. I think that's true. We're, I guess I'm biased. I think we're some of the best people on earth. <laughs> it's a passion, Harold, yeah. and you have it. Well, you got it too. We all got it. That's what June means. We we all love what we're doing, and uh, we're doing great things. Sometimes you get wrapped up in your daily work. You don't realize what good work you are doing. So, what would it, advice would you have to someone like me or Stacy or someone? <laughs> Someone young coming in into a profession like this, can, can, can you name three things that you might advise us on? Well, that's pretty tough. I don't know how you can answer that. I think it's born in you. You can't help it. If you want to be a, a biologist and you want to do something good for the wife, for the profession, you'll do it. You don't have anybody else to tell you. But I'd say passion is part of it. You got to, you know. Give your whole life to what you're doing. And I'd say don't be afraid to speak out. I've, I've never backed away from a tough job. Sometimes you have to work outside the, what's that word they use? Outside the cloth or whatever. Outside the box. Yeah. Well, you don't have to sell your soul just because you work for the, whatever agency you work for. You can still you can be independent. Within reason. Those are good words of advice. I, I, I've been very fortunate. The people I work for gave me quite a bit of latitude. I think sometimes I always told people if I thought I was in a hot spot, like I could sell my boss, here's what I'm going to do, I'm going to write these letters. And then they know when it comes back, they're not blindsided. I think that's important. No supervisor likes to be blindsided. Have one of these workers do something he doesn't know about. Okay. 
Anything else you want us to cover? I feel I feel really fortunate. I had a good career. And blessed with health, I can do what I want to do. <laughs> Survive Korea. Yes. That was a life's been good to me. I want to commend all you people in the firing line. I call it the firing line. You're out there now. When you get retired like I am, young people want to know what you did. <laughs> Every generation has got a lot to offer. I'm a firm believer in that. Things are different now. A lot of people look back and say, well, why don't you do it like we did it? But it's a process of evolution. I'm a firm believer in, in our field of wildlife management. Every generation draws on the last generation. And gets, I think you get better and better as time goes on. The more we learn. With the help of the people who preceded us. Well, I draw, I'd like to say, I, I learned a lot from people who were 20 years older than me when I was young. I've always been one to respect older people, my superiors or whatever. I learned a lot from them. Well, it's been a delight thinking back on some of my life and I appreciate the opportunity. Well, I know we certainly appreciate hearing about it. And I know I know that uh, I enjoy visiting with you. This well, is not one thing, one thing we haven't talked about okay. is uh, one thing we do every winter, the only part of it. We get a I get a big table set up out here and invite four or five, six, seven, eight guys down and we have a great game dinner, dinner down here. I make the meat, get rid of some of my ducks and geese and cranes, different people bring in a dish and we have a whale of the night down here, don't we? We do. Just like tonight, telling stories. <laughs> Reminiscing. Yeah. Learning about each other. Probably a tip of beer or two. Now that's... My, that's... Wife, my wife June would always tell us that the more we have, the more beer we have, the louder we get. <laughs> Sometimes you get more accomplished doing Those that. Those are fun nights, aren't yes, they? Yeah. We're going to have one here pretty soon, I think. Okay. Usually in January, we'll have get together. I think that's, those are important things, in, even in, in the career, as well as your life, to spend some time away from work with the people you work with. Oh, yeah. To learn more about them. Absolutely. And, and can help you, I, too. I call it camaraderie. There's a great, a great amount of that among our people. Uh, After you leave, I'll probably, I didn't have much when I was a kid. I call myself just a skinny kid that hung out. <laughs> well, I know that what I strive for comes from mentors like you. And I know that you, you had a number of mentors, as oh, you were yeah. saying, as that, you that's came That's the point up I want to make. Yeah. And the same and people are looking up to you right now, some of these younger people coming to work. That's how it works. That's what I'm trying to say. Each generation has a great deal to offer. We're, we're looking at these words, this legacy that you're leaving, and <laughs> maybe this little bit of a tape will add to that legacy, but to uh, pass on to some folks that maybe can't come down here and sit with you. And well, one more thing. That way. One more thing I want to hope to accomplish is uh, I maintain a hunting diary for the last 50 years. Every every duck hunt I've been on, I've got a, a, a record of it in my diary. And I'd like to write kind of a book encompassing my hunting life, and I want to encapsulate my professional life. It'd be a two-phase book. One would be hunting. And I want to encapsulate some of my major professional papers in a popular style so a duck hunter can understand the meaning of it. Uh, I've been involved with a lot of wonderful research projects, and I can't even talk about all of them now. But the nesting car was part of it, but uh, the <coughs> work I did with John Okamon over made a study of Mark Bird from Howard and Gadwall Hen and their duckling 
for me. That's the kind of thing I want to put in this book. In the technical paper, the editors, I put it this way, they, they edit out what I call the exciting part of it. Oh, you can't say that, you know. There's too much emotion in that. Well, that's what I want to put in this book. My emotion. Yeah. <laughs> Harold, you're well, you know what I'm saying? Like a, a 15 or 20 page technical article, you boil that down to one page, you get the meat of it. That's what I want to do in this book. You're 70 some years old. 70, I'll be 75 next June. 70, 74 and a half years old. Yeah, and June won't let me, she won't let me gain. I said, I'm almost said, you're still 74. 74. Yeah, that's right. And that the passion, that fire that you had, 50 years ago, has not died. I guess not. That's what some of these people said back here. Ted Upton said, at 74 years of age, Harold Dubert will not relent. He cannot relent any more than the wildfowl he studied and hunted can change the way, the way they find home. I like that. That describes you, Harold. Here's what my friend Gary Pierce and I'm James Town. This book is about the great tradition of waterfowl hunting on Dakota prairies. Harold Duber is an eminently knowledgeable practitioner of the art. He has dedicated his professional career to preserving waterfowl and his private life to perpetuating those traditions. That's kind of what you said. That's in his buzzwords in the back here. <laughs> Well, I appreciate having the time to sit and visit with you. It's been fun for me.